Well, good morning, everyone. And on this beautiful, crisp, frosty morning, I'd like to offer you a very warm welcome to St. Nicholas Church at Lady Boswell's. If this is the first time that you've joined us online, I'm delighted that you could be with us. And may I encourage you after our service to have a look at our website, St. Nicholas Church, Seven Oaks, and that will give you more information about who we are, what we do, and why we do it. Of course, we can't meet in person at the moment, but we can meet in spirit to worship God together as a church family united in love for one another. Now, I've got one note especially for the children. I got an email from Hannah a day or two ago, and it was full of these wonderful activity sheets. I know you probably can't see them on the screen, but hopefully your mums and dads have had the video. Look, there's all sorts of exciting things here for the children to do, so get your activity sheets ready. If you haven't got them, give mum or dad a nudge. And if they haven't got them, ask them to have a chat with Hannah later on, and she'll get that organised for you. Well, today, we're all going to focus together on God's grace, and we're going to begin with our first song. This is Amazing Grace. Take my place That 
Apostle Paul wrote a letter to Timothy. He said to Timothy, The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. And in the Old Testament, Nehemiah spoke about God. And he said, You are a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. So how can we respond to these wonderful truths about our God? By telling him how truly sorry we are and repenting of our sins. So let's pray to God together using the words on the screen. Father, We have sinned against heaven and against you. We are not worthy to be called your children. We turn to you again. Have mercy on us. Bring us back to yourself as those who once were dead, but now have life through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The opening verse from our passage today says, Since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And now we have a a video from Hannah to watch together. Oh, cleaning, 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 cleaning so much. Hello everybody, Um, how are you today? My name is is Sadie, it's lovely to meet you and I am a cleaning lady and there is so many cleaning jobs for me to be doing. I need to, let me show you. I need to uh, sweep the floor, so sweep, sweep, sweep and then when I have swept the floor I need to uh, mop the floor, my mop, my mop, oh clean the floor, mop the floor. And then uh, when I have uh, mopped the floor, I need to uh, do the dishes. Lots of, uh, lots of dishes for me to be doing. Cleaning, cleaning, cleaning. And then I, uh, I need to uh, clean the windows, clean the windows, clean them so they're nice and, nice and clear, clean the windows. And then when I have uh, cleaned the windows, I need to, uh, oh, I need to wipe down the, the benches. Wipe, wipe, wipe. There is, uh, there is just always so much cleaning to do. You see, cleaning is my job. And uh, when I have cleaned, when I have done all of the cleaning, I, uh, I get money, I get, I get paid for my job. And uh, here, when I have cleaned, I get money and it, it, it's mine because I, I did my cleaning work. But I, uh, I only get money when I have done my cleaning work. I don't get it before. But, uh, do you know what happens to me this morning? I'll show you. Something came through my door and uh, hit. It, uh, it was a, a, an envelope and it said, for Sadie. That's, that's me. This is for me. And uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't expecting this. So I, uh, I opened it up. And uh, inside, uh, there, was, uh, there, was, there was some other money. Some 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 money and uh, just like that and uh, i was i was so surprised i was so surprised and uh, so i uh I, I i looked in the envelope again and uh there was a note a note that uh that told me something let me read you this note it's very interesting i will show you i will show you 
it says this, you have been saved by grace because you believe. You did not save yourselves. It was a gift from God. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. And then, then I understood something amazing. I didn't get this money because I, I worked for it. No, I didn't work for this money. This money was a gift. I got it for free. And, uh, in the Bible, that's what God says grace is. And God does the same thing as the person who gave me money, but much, 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 much bigger. God doesn't save me from my sin because I worked hard. He, he doesn't save me because I was a good person. He doesn't save me because I do good things. He doesn't even save me because I tried very hard or because inside I was very good even though I made some mistakes. No, 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 no. When God saved me, it was a gift. I got it for free. I don't deserve to be saved. And saving me cost God a lot. It cost him the death of his son, his son, Jesus. But now anyone who trusts in Jesus can be saved. And the word for that is grace. That's what the Bible said, grace. Grace means that we don't work to be saved. Grace is a free gift from God. Wow, what an amazing gift that is. Now, I know Christmas might seem a long time ago now, but I suspect that even though we couldn't see all of our family necessarily at Christmas, we still would have had some nice gifts. And quite a few gifts come with instructions. Maybe you've had a new Lego model or a sewing kit, or maybe grown-ups, you recently bought some flat pack furniture. So what do we do with the instructions when we take them out of the box? Do we throw them away? Do we chuck them in the rubbish bin? That would be crazy, wouldn't it? You can't possibly put a complicated kit together without the instructions. Well, God has given us some really helpful instructions for life. And they're in the Bible. And Susan's now going to read us today's passage. I'm reading this morning from Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. We have been made right with God because of our faith. So we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through our faith, Christ has brought us into that blessing of God's grace that we now enjoy. And we are happy because of the hope we have of sharing God's glory. And we also have joy with our troubles because we know that these troubles produce patience. And patience produces character. And character produces hope. And this hope will never disappoint us because God has poured out his love to fill our hearts. God gave us his love through the Holy Spirit whom God has given to us. Christ died for us while we were still weak. We were living against God, but at the right time, Christ died for us. Very few people will die to save the life of someone else, although perhaps for a good man, someone might possibly die. But Christ died for us while we were still sinners. In this way, God shows his great love for us. We have been made right with God by the blood of Christ's death. So through Christ, we will surely be saved from God's anger. I mean that while we were God's enemies, God made friends with us through the death of his son. Surely 
Now that we are God's friends, God will save us through his son's life. And not only that, but now we are also very happy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Jesus, we are now God's friends again. We've got uh, three notices for you this morning. The first one is a video clip telling us about Hope Explored. I wonder how you're feeling about the next few weeks or the next few months. Many of us are just stealing ourselves for what we hope will be the last big push before better days. Maybe you've got kids at home and you are just trying to survive. Maybe you are at home alone and you are just longing for a conversation with friends over a kitchen table. Whatever it is that we're longing for, there are few things that are more crushing than having our hopes disappointed. And any hope that's worth having needs to be based on truth. Hope needs to deliver something good. It needs to deliver something that will last. You see, Hope Explored is a four-week mini-series on Monday nights looking into the hope that Jesus offers. Starting on Monday the 11th of January, we're going to meet and chat to author Jeremy Marshall about his hope in the face of death. And then for the rest of the series, we're going to look just a bit further into the hope and the peace and the meaning that Jesus offers us. If you would like to join us online, you could register on the St Nicholas webpage. And during these dark days of January, we do hope that you will join us as we begin Hope Explored. Uh, we also have our Bible study groups starting up again. 
So if you're a member of a study group, do contact your study group leader to find out more details if they've not contacted you already. If you're not in a Bible study group, may I encourage you to think about joining one. There are two very good reasons for being a member of a study group. The first is it gives you the opportunity to study God's word, to talk through it together and learn more from it together. And the second equally important reason is to have a time to be able to encourage one another. It's not just about learning from the Bible. It's, all, it's also about encouraging each other and helping each other as we walk in our daily lives, serving Jesus Christ. So if you are interested, do contact John or Hannah and they'll be able to give you more details. And finally, one more notice. This one's for the children. So children, if you're still listening in, I found out the other day that if you want to share your activity sheet with our church family, you can ask mum or dad to take a photo and they can post it on our church Facebook page and you can share what you've done with everyone in church. So, I hope you've got your pens and paper, pencils, pens, worksheets all ready because John is now going to tell us more about the passage that Susan read to us. Good morning, everyone. It's, um, it's great to be able to speak to you uh, through YouTube and a massive thank you to our tech team who is making uh, all this possible. It's about uh, six or seven degrees in the hall, so if you excuse me for wearing this um, sleeping blanket. Um, just a few other little notices. Uh, it's been a really, really difficult call to actually stop us uh, gathering as God's people around his word on Sundays. It's been difficult because uh, so much of the New Testament pushes us in that direction. Uh, it says it's really good, uh, it's really important, um, not just for us to receive that blessing, but for us to bless others as we encourage one another. Uh, the reason for us not gathering then is really um, out of a desire to love our neighbours in this current crisis. It's that the fact that the hospitals are full to overflowing at the moment, and so we just want to do everything we can to, to really love and bless our local community because we're not apart from them, we're not above them. It's a really difficult call to suspend um, that gathering, um, but we hope to, um, to regather as soon as it's possible. Um, some friends of ours uh, and many other churches across the UK are continuing to gather, and um, I think it's something that they need to weigh up and we need to weigh up in our own context. And so um, there's neither right nor wrong in that, um, but what's important has been uh, faithful uh, to, to the Lord with the conscience that he's given us. That means that we're very isolated at the moment. Some of us have the opportunity and the time to go out for exercise with one other person, uh, and that's great. Uh, others of us may be working 14-hour jobs or with the kids at home, having to be homeschooled. Um, that's really difficult. Uh, whatever our situation is, we really want to be supporting you during this time. So could you please let us know if you feel like you could use some extra support? Uh, and we would uh, love you to get in touch with uh, myself, Hannah, or your Bible study group leaders, if that's the case. So please don't be shy. Let us know, because we'd love to uh, encourage you. Uh, COVID is not new. It is new, but in some ways it's not new. Uh, the world has been dealing with disease and plagues and wars and all sorts of troubles. And that's because it's a world which is broken by our human rebellion against our Creator. And yet the good news is that He has not left us on our own. He has entered a world of suffering and death to bring us hope, to bring us salvation. He's taken it on Himself. So I'm going to really uh, start, this, uh, start this time by praying for our country and that uh, God would uh, speak to us through his word now. Uh, dear Father God, thank you so much that you are a God who has uh, not abandoned this world, that you have sent the Lord Jesus into the thick of it, into suffering, rejection, sickness and death. And Father, we thank you for him, and we pray that uh, you would please look with mercy and cause that great message of salvation through Christ to resound through the world, especially at this time. And we pray, as that happens, that you would also have mercy on our world, giving wisdom to leaders, 
giving wisdom to the NHS and other doctors and nurses. Please help us uh, in our time of great need. And Father, we look to you now to fulfill your word. May your unfailing love come to us as you have promised. In Jesus' name, amen. Please do uh, open your Bibles, grab hold of a Bible and open it to Romans chapter 5 as we jump into this great passage in this new series called Living Under Grace. Um, My hope, my prayer for us over the next six weeks is that we would get to soak in grace. Uh, The pool next door is closed, you can't go swimming. But Romans invites us to swim, to dive into grace. Uh, The restaurants on the high street, they're closed. But in Romans over the next few weeks, we're going to have the opportunity to feast richly on God's grace. I really, uh, that's my prayer for us, that we'd really get to delve in deep to grace. Um, Just a few words by way of introduction for the book of Romans. Uh, It has three purposes that all sort of intersect around grace. Uh, The first, you can see, is what really uh, the apostle needs to uh, introduce his gospel of grace to the Romans. They haven't met him yet, so he needs to introduce his gospel. In uh, chapter 1, verse 1, which will hopefully come up below me, it says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. And he's also writing to a, to a church that is of mixed origins, of, of Greek, uh, Gentiles, non-Jews, and Jews, with all their differences. And so he's looking to unite them under grace. Uh, chapter 15, verse 6 says, So that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then finally, uh, he is speaking, uh, he is seeking, sorry, uh, their support for a grace fueled mission to Spain and beyond. And we see that in chapter 15, verse 24. I hope to see you while passing through and to have you assist me on my journey there. That's to Spain. And so these three purposes will be our guide to help us understand uh, the Bible on its own terms. And that will help us to understand what the Holy Spirit is saying to us as a church today. See, be it to the Romans or to us, to be an effectual missional church, we're going to need to understand grace. We're going to need to believe it. Grace is essential for effectiveness. See, it's essential for for reaching seven oaks in the world. It's essential for nurturing one another, for equipping the saints, and sending out workers into the worldwide harvest. See, it's only grace that can make us humble and generous people. Grace brings about a humility where we don't actually need to compete with each other or judge one another. Uh, We can actually learn from one another. We can serve each other and be served by one another. Grace makes that possible, that humility possible. And grace also fosters generosity. It's a willingness to to look outside ourselves and to, to reach out to those unlike us. It causes us to be generous to people we've never seen and have never met so that they can know the Lord Jesus through world mission. Although we may never see them or meet them in this life, we look forward to confidence of meeting them in the next. Effective churches are humble and they're uh, generous, and it only comes from standing in grace. And standing in grace is our title for today's talk, and it comes from the passage's headline, which which uh, Jerry alluded to, verses 1 to 2. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. Uh, Paul's argument so far is uh, that we humans are not naturally at peace with God. Actually, we're naturally uh, at enmity with God. Left to our own devices, Uh, We rebel against him and he's angry with us. In chapters 1 and 2, the the Gentiles rebel in their own way, the non-Jews. They rebel by worshipping idols and dishonouring the creator God, even though he's made this marvellous world. Uh, For the Jews in chapters 2 to 3, well, they rebel in their own way. 
uh, as a covenant people, they know God's laws and stipulations, and yet they don't keep them. The net result is that all uh, Jews and Gentiles, we naturally stand condemned. All of humanity under the judgment of God. And that's why uh, chapter 1 verse 18 opens up saying, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of people. See, God is against us. But the good news is that Paul brings is that God is also for us. That he can't help but take pity on those made in his image. Uh, yes, that image is corrupted by sin, and, but it's not totally demolished. And God has not given up on those made in his image. He's made a way for them to be right through the death of his son. And the net result, well, is that now in the present, in the present believers have a new peace with God. Uh, they no longer stand condemned, but they've, they've switched to, being, to standing in grace. That's what verse 2 says. So chapters uh, 1 to 3, will they bring us under grace? And chapters 5 through to 8, will they teach us about living under grace? And living under grace is such a, a quantum leap for us as human beings in our thinking well, that we need a total reboot to really live by it, to embrace it. Uh, the implications of standing in grace for today, well, they're massive, and there are three of them in today's passage. It means that we can have hope in suffering, assurance of God's love, and a great certainty about future salvation. Let's look at each of those and how they build on one another. First, then, we have hope in suffering, verses 3 to 5. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. I wonder what your gut reaction was to that verse when I read it. Maybe you thought, Christians, glory and suffering, they're crazy. Or maybe you thought, glory and suffering, I'm a Christian and I don't do that. I'm a rubbish Christian. After all, how, how many folks will, will sort of skip down the street because they've been bullied at school? Or how many of us rejoice uh, if we're made redundant? If a loved one goes into hospital? If a marriage is finding if we're finding marriage really difficult. How many of us are rejoicing under lockdown episode three? It's like there's, I know a frost has settled on Seven Oaks this morning, but this week it's felt like melancholy has settled on Seven Oaks this, uh, this week. So how can the apostle say that believers glory in suffering? Well, it's not a typo. Uh, chapters five and eight, the sort of top and tail of the section, well, it's all about having hope in suffering. And the because in verse 3 explains the logic. See, God doesn't want us to detach our brains as we come to church or as we look at our Bibles at home. No, no, no. God wants us to use our brains. So let's have a look at the reason, four reasons about Christian suffering that Paul knows about Christian suffering. Firstly, it produces perseverance. Uh, that's the quality of a person who, who keeps on going. Uh, think of the marathon runner. And perseverance produces character. Well, that's an inner quality, uh, one that is tested and true. It's not fool's gold. No, 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 this is gold that is refined, inspected, and tested. See, until believers suffer, well, they are untested. But when they've suffered, persevered, well, then their faith is stamped authentic. And character produces hope. Uh, this is not a crossing of the fingers, but the sort of hope forged in suffering. One that your heart goes all in on. It's the hope of glory, the hope of resurrection, new bodies being transformed into the likeness of Christ. When he robes us in righteousness and when he crowns us with glory. 2021 has already disappointed many people's hopes. Uh, someone on WhatsApp uh, sent a message saying, uh, Dear 2021, <clears throat> I've taken the seven-day trial, but I'd like a refund, please. But verse 5 says, uh, This hope does not put us to shame. 
And on Monday nights, in our first episode of Hope Explored that we heard about, while interviewing Jeremy Marshall, when he was a child, his parents would take them on holidays, smuggling Bibles into the East Block of Europe. I don't know what you did for holidays, but my parents certainly didn't do that. And as they went into the East Block, well, they met Christians who really knew what it was to suffer. Uh, Because they had very little, well, they knew that they had Jesus. And so they had a vibrant faith and a really certain hope. And I just wonder if perhaps God will use this pandemic to give us Christians here in the West, where life is so normally so comfortable, well, to give us a share in their hope. Verse 5 says that hope will not disappoint us. See, the promise here is that suffering will develop perseverance. Perseverance grows us in Christ's likeness, and Christ's likeness in that hope of resurrection glory. We can rejoice in suffering because we know our suffering is not in vain. God promises to use it. He is so great that he's able to redeem believers' suffering, to grow us in perseverance, in character, and in hope. And that hope won't disappoint us. It won't embarrass us because, again, verse 5, God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who, who has been given to us. And this leads on to our second point. Standing in grace means we are assured of God's love. Hope will not disappoint us because the Holy Spirit has, has opened up the floodgates of God's love into our hearts. See, knowing the love of God is a personal experience that requires the Holy Spirit. Uh, the love of God is no philosophy, it's no tagline, it's a tangible, personal experience. By the Spirit's enlightening the eyes of our hearts, God, about who God is and what he's done for us, that's how we know God's love in a personal way. Without the Holy Spirit, well, God's love just remains a nice idea or philosophy. But someone might say, that sounds lovely, but is it actually true? It all sounds very um, subjective. And anyway, there are loads of well-being blogs and positive thinking books that can assure me of kind of the universe's love for me. Why do I need Jesus? On verses 6 to 8, Paul anchors the subjective in the objective. He anchors the love of God in the objective death of Christ. And when did he die? It says when we were ungodly. That is to say, when we are as far away from him as we could be. If you were to tunnel uh, down through Seven Oaks to the Earth's core and sort of pop out the end of the the world, can you guess where you'd pop out? You'd pop out wet for starters, but you'd pop out just off the southern coast of Chile. That is the furthest point in the world from Seven Oaks. And that's when Jesus died, when we were as far off from God as we could be. And not only far off, but it says powerless. Uh, Like when you see those old David Attenborough uh, documentaries of uh, an orca whale, a killer whale with us hunting down a seal. And that huge beast of a creature, that whale, just gets that little seal in its jaws and throws it around and flips it around. That's when Christ came for us, when we were tormented, when we were enslaved to the devil and sin. And how did the invisible God make his love visible to the world? It was through the death of his son, for us. The words for us are twice repeated. Verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God's love through the Holy Spirit is a subjective experience. But God's love for us is objectively made visible in the public crucifixion in history of Jesus. His blood is a symbol of his life, and the words for us convey substitution. See, by sinning, by sinning, we stood condemned, guilty of offending the eternal God under a divine death penalty. Outside of Jesus, that's where every believer would be. But God's love is objectively seen in Jesus swapping places with us. 
See, his good and pure and perfect life is substituted for ours. He gets our death and we get his life. It's a payment. Do you remember the warm days of the very first lockdown? They were so pleasant. Lots of people were out in their gardens. I'm sure I could even smell some barbecues. And it was so warm that if you were a child, you could, you could take a magnifying glass, capture the sun's rays, find some twigs, and even cause a little barbecue fire if you wanted for yourself. You know, the intensity of the rays just focused down on that one point. In the death of the Lord Jesus, something similar is happening. God's wrath against condemned sinners, well, it's been focused. All that wrath has been focused on one point. It's been focused on the Lord Jesus himself. And it's why on the cross he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? His blood, his life for yours. And the result is that wrath is removed and we now have peace with God. Real peace brought by real blood. Does God love you? Does he really love you? Well, how else do you explain all that blood? If there's any doubt whether believers have peace with God now and into the future, Paul puts it to rest in in verses 9 to 10. Standing in grace means we have a certain hope of future salvation. Verse 9 now looks to the future day of God's wrath, the day of judgment. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? See, the Bible is really clear that, that God has set a future day of global reckoning. That's both the best news and the worst news you're going to hear. It's the best news because it means every act of oppression, every act of racism, every act of harassment, every act of injustice, every crime will have its comeuppance. God will make things right. That's both the worst news you'll hear. Because actually we've all played a part in the world's evil. We've all, none of us have come away scot-free. Paul knows us believers so well, doesn't he? He knows how feeble our faith can be, how the experience of suffering now can leave us with lingering thoughts that perhaps, perhaps I'm not fully forgiven. Perhaps God has some sort of residual anger still at work towards me. That perhaps in the end, God won't actually get me over the line. He won't forgive me. And here Paul wants us to put such fears to rest for good. And he does that by arguing with us by comparisons. Have a look at verse 10. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through his life? How much more is repeated twice? If God saved us while we were his enemies, well, how much more will he save us now that we're his friends, now that we have peace with him? To feel the weight of this, Calvin reminds us of how bad our old predicament used to be. He says enemies are estranged from God through sin, heirs of wrath, subject to the curse of eternal death, excluded from all hope of salvation, Beyond every blessing of God, the slave of Satan, captive under the yoke of sin, and destined for a final dreadful destruction. That's how bad our previous predicament was. And that's when God made peace with us. That's when Jesus reconciled us to the Father. And if that's the case, then logically, well, how much more confident can we be in future rescue, now that we no longer stand condemned, but we now stand in grace. Do you believe it? The Father no longer frowns on us as sinners, but smiles on us as his children. Do we believe it? If we do, it will make us calm, peaceful, and even eager for the day of God's return when he comes to judge the world. See, it transforms that day into a day of of great tragedy into a day of great rejoicing where he where where God says to his beloved forgiven children in Christ a daughter it's so good to see you or son 
Well done, my good and faithful servant. Standing in grace, if we believe it, gives us a certain hope of future salvation. The believers in Rome, like us, live in a world plagued by suffering, insecurity and anxiety about the future. Now, their experience of standing in grace is like ours. It's, it's suffering now with the promise of future glory later. And as we press deeper into God's grace today, well, the most natural response for us this afternoon and into next week and the year ahead is to boast uh, boasting in self-righteousness is an un- ugly thing, and there's really no reason for it. But boasting in God's grace is a God-honoring thing, and there are plenty of reasons for it. See, to, to, to boast towards each other and to others about God and how he uses our suffering to grow us in resurrection hope. To boast that we that God demonstrated his love for us in the death of Jesus, that we are sure of that love, and to boast that we have peace with God now, and that gives us a great and certain hope for the future. See, boasting in ourselves is ugly, but boasting in Jesus, that's a beautiful thing. That's when God is made beautiful. That's the sort of boasting that builds a church. May we be those who speak to our, each other, and to speak of others, of the grace in which we now stand. Amen. Let me finish in a short prayer, and then Jane will come up and pray for us. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Heavenly Father, how can we thank you and praise you enough that though we were once your enemies, though we were once so far off, you reached out and rescued us through the death of your beloved Son, our Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you and we praise you for the peace that we now have through him. We thank you, Father, that even our sufferings you will use to bring about future glory and the hope of resurrection. As we go into this rest of this day, into the rest of the week and the year ahead, Whatever it brings, Father, may we go into it resting assured of your love for us and with a certain hope of future salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray. As we've heard, Romans 5 says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being willing to die and suffer for us on the cross so that we are justified by faith in you and your saving grace. We know that there is absolutely nothing we can do to save ourselves, but that you alone are the way, the truth and the life. We pray for our nation at this very difficult time. Thank you for the peace we have that you are in control and sovereign over all. We pray for the doctors and nurses caring for patients with COVID-19. Please give them physical and emotional strength as they are so overworked at this time. We pray that you would give those who have faith in you opportunities to speak about their faith and that they would know that you are their strength. We also pray for all hospital staff, such as porters, cleaners, those who cook meals, and all in administration. We ask for wisdom for the Prime Minister and government, scientists, hospital managers, and all those making key decisions, that they would make wise decisions during this pandemic. Thank you so much for the gift of vaccines and that the COVID-19 vaccination programme has started and that many have already been vaccinated. We also pray for all those workers um, such as paramedics, teachers, police and the fire brigade, supermarket staff and those collecting our rubbish. Please protect them from the virus as they work to help us. 
And we ask that you would comfort those who are grieving for lost loved ones or whose relatives are seriously ill in hospital. Most of all, we pray for the heart of this nation, that you would use this time of fear, anxiety and mourning to turn the hearts of many to you. And we lift the children who are unable to go to school at the moment to you. We pray for their physical and mental health and that they would continue to learn and get a good education, particularly those who are in exam years or from disadvantaged homes. Please also help parents as they have to homeschool. We pray for our mission partner, Beverly Park Hill, working with OMF. Thank you, Lord, for your protection over OMF members worldwide during the pandemic, as well as your provision for her and for OMF UK, and for the ministry you have given her over the last year. And as we move into 2021, her diary is starting to fill up again with a variety of meetings. We pray for wisdom for the OMF leadership team as they look ahead and plan for the next five years. And now a prayer for our vision. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love towards us, revealed in granting us new life in Christ. Please enable us to know him better, so that we might grow in our understanding and experience of Christ, both individually and together. Grant that by your work of your spirit, we might be nourished and nurtured through your word in order to grow in Christ-likeness to the praise of your name. And a verse from 1 Peter to finish. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. To him be the power for ever and ever. Amen. We're now going to sing our final song, Grace Unmeasured, Fast and Free. Strength to run this race And when my
brings us to the end of the YouTube part of our service this morning, but we will be continuing online via Zoom uh, around quarter past 11. So if you're not sure of the login and you'd like to join us, do have a look at the weekly email or on the St. Nicholas Seven Oaks website. We've just sung about grace unmeasured, vast and free. And we've read that God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. So let's close with a prayer together. Thank you, Father, for your amazing grace, your never-ending love, and your unconditional forgiveness. Please help us all to live by your grace through the power of your Holy Spirit this coming week. Amen.